Sam McVeigh was one of the top black heavyweights that competed in the early 20th century. He defeated fighters like Joe Jeanette, Harry Wills, and Sam Langford. Powerfully built at 5'10 and weighing 200 pounds, he built up his record while touring France, who fell in love with the man they called. <laughs> Little is known of Sam McVeigh's early life. The belief is that he was born in Texas on May 17, 1883, but spent most of his early days in Oxnard, California. McVeigh was told he was ugly as a young boy, and his father gave him a silver pipe as a present, telling him to keep it until he saw a man who was even uglier than he was. One reporter stated that McVeigh was so ugly that he could scare back the rising moon, while heavyweight champion Jack Johnson said that McVeigh was the ugliest fighter ever born. Working as a buggy washer at a horse stable, McVeigh began to box against other farmhands in the evening. Billy Roche, the owner of the stable, was so impressed with McVeigh's fighting skill that he signed him to a five-year contract. McVeigh began his official boxing career in April of 1902, despite suffering from bunions on both feet, as he had to have custom shoes designed to help alleviate the pain. After a successful first year as a pro boxer, McVeigh challenged Jack Johnson for the world-colored heavyweight title. McVeigh was no match for Johnson, who sent the teenager back to California, bruised and battered. McVeigh's manager Roche lobbied for a rematch and got one eight months later. Heavyweight champion James Jeffries was looking for an opponent, and Roche believed that a win over Johnson could propel McVeigh into a title shot. The manager spent $250 of his own money to have a dual championship belt made for the colored heavyweight title, so sure he was that McVeigh would win. But Johnson dominated McVeigh again, flooring him twice and knocking out several of his teeth. Six months later, they fought a third time with McVeigh getting knocked out in the 20th round. McVeigh parted ways with Roche, moving to San Francisco. He took off almost a year and a half from the sport and returned a better fighter in 1906, defeating Denver Ed Martin. McVeigh expressed frustration as he was limited to facing only other black fighters, seeking more opportunity. He toured Europe in 1907, settling in France where he became a fan favorite. He began calling for a match against the now heavyweight champion Tommy Burns, but Burns said that the only black fighter he was willing to face was Jack Johnson. French sports writers then questioned Burns' integrity. Why is it that the champion refuses to meet Sam McVeigh? A Nouveau Sports editorial read, Can it be that Sam McVeigh is at Paris, so very near to Burns, while Johnson is at Chicago, so very far away? McVeigh went on a lengthy win streak in France, and with no color barrier, he was embraced by the fans and press alike. They nicknamed him the Black Beauty and the Black Bison of the Boulevard, selling figurines of him in the streets. McVeigh enjoyed his time in Paris, taking in ballet and holding season tickets to the Cologne concerts. But McVeigh had to save face after winning a boring 20-round decision over Joe Jeanette. Ringsiders believed that neither fighter had given their all. The two agreed to a rematch with fight-to-the-finish rules. There would be no decision, no technical knockout, no draw, and no time limit. These rules resulted in a brutal fight in which both fighters displayed superhuman levels of endurance. Jeanette was floored numerous times, and on a few occasions, ringsiders believed that he should have been counted out. At one point, Jeanette's trainer ran up the steps and poured a bucket of water to revive his unconscious fighter. The trainer also had the ringside physician administer a bag of oxygen to Jeanette, reviving him between the 19th and 20th round. Each time I dropped him, everybody around ringside thought he was through, McVeigh said. But Joe would get up and some way and somehow save himself from the fatal count of 10. McVeigh remembers feeling dizzy in the 49th round as Jeanette taunted him. Come on in here, boy, Jeanette said. We're going to do some more fighting and I'll knock the tar out of you yet. I'm human, McVeigh said, and I can't stand this any longer. 
You can win this little fight if you want to, but don't you forget that I knocked you down so often that it'll take you a month to figure it out. With that, McVeigh went back to his corner and flopped on his stool, telling the referee that he was through for the evening. Eight months later, they fought again, battling to a 30-round draw. McVeigh continued to box in France, defeating everyone put in front of him. Word of his victories in Europe reached the States. Sam Lankford's manager cabled Paris to let McVeigh know that if he ever ran out of willing opponents, Lankford would take a boat over for a fight or two. In 1911, an epic rivalry began. The two traveled the world to fight each other with stops in Paris, Sydney, Perth, Brisbane, Boston, New York, Denver, Syracuse, Akron, Chicago, and Avellaneda, Argentina. McVeigh won two of the encounters, Langford seven, and they had six draws. Their first bout on April 1st, 1911, was scored a draw by the referee, who was the only one judging the fight. The partisan McVeigh crowd in Paris booed the decision, switching allegiances as they enjoyed Sam Langford's aggressive fighting style. I was defeated, McVeigh said, and I am the first to recognize this. Langford is too powerful and too hard. My blows came up against a wall. Langford admitted that McVeigh was one of his toughest opponents, claiming that his arms had a weird bent to them, making his jab into a hook which Langford found difficult to evade. Over time, it became increasingly hard to get a fight between the two, as McVeigh was tired of being beaten up by Langford, and Langford was tired of facing someone that he'd have to train for. When he was told that his manager had arranged yet another fight with McVeigh, Langford grew angry. For the Lord's sake, Langford said, ain't there anybody else I can fight except that big smoke? Langford also marveled at McVeigh's punching power in their numerous matches. Once he hit me with a left hook, Langford said, and I thought the fight was over. Everything got black and I saw stars and eight Sam McVeigh's and angels and undertakers and the loveliest pallbearers and nice flowers in St. Peter, nearly everything one sees when one gets to heaven. McVeigh saw Langford as one of the toughest men that ever lived. Every time he hit me, McVeigh said, it made me think that an express train had rammed into me. McVeigh was scheduled to get a title shot against Jack Johnson in April of 1912 in Australia, but financial troubles intervened and Johnson fought Fireman Jim Flynn instead. McVeigh continued his battles with Langford in Australia, in addition to engaging in roughhouse matches, boxer versus martial artist events. McVeigh faced an Australian jiu-jitsu expert in a best two out of three contest, a no-holds-bar affair with the rule that either man could resign, or in today's parlance, submit, if they are helpless. McVeigh thought the match was a joke and started the fight laughing. The jiu-jitsu expert placed him in an armbar and forced him to submit. But the move only made McVeigh angry. In the second bout, the jiu-jitsu expert once again reached for McVeigh, but this time he was greeted by a right cross to the chin. The martial artist fell and McVeigh jumped on top of him, grabbed both of his ears and slammed his head into the canvas. The martial artist fell unconscious and once revived, conceded defeat. Another jiu-jitsu expert, Tano Matsuda, arrived in Australia to face McVeigh in a roughhouse rules fight. He was knocked out by McVeigh's first punch, a left jab. Returning to the sport of boxing, McVeigh knocked out one of the premier white hopes of the time period named Arthur Pelkey, while also defeating Harry Wills, Sam Langford, and battling Jim Johnson. These victories compelled McVeigh to call for a bout with new champion Jess Willard. Willard refused, stating that he had no intention to fight a colored man again. The heavyweight title now on ice with Willard on the throne, McVeigh once again took the international route, taking fights in Argentina and Chile before touring Panama for two years. He returned to the States but remained out of the boxing game for a year and a half. He began a comeback but by his own admission he was now slow, old, and a little bit fat. McVeigh found work as a sparring partner for Jess Willard, trying to earn an extra $50 if he could knock the champion down. He then later became a sparring partner for Jack Dempsey. McVeigh cursed his fortunes as he saw how much money the likes of Dempsey and George Carpentier were pooling in the business. He had once advised Carpentier while he toured France, earning the Frenchman's respect. Much of my success in the rope square was due to his encouragement and words of wisdom, Carpentier said. In 1921, McVeigh developed pneumonia 
and died at the age of 38 in a hospital in Harlem. Despite engaging in over 98 professional bouts, McVeigh was penniless. Jack Johnson stepped in and paid for a proper funeral as he didn't want his old rival to be buried in a pauper's grave.